Next talk we have is Python and CFFI visualizing network traces by Abhijit. Abhijit, stage is yours. Okay. Hey, thanks, people. Or okay, let's get started. Hi, everyone. I hope everyone can see my screen and uh, can hear me. I'm just assuming that. So this talk is going to be about a package called CFFI and how we can use it with Python to actually perform uh, a function called as how do you visualize network traces. Okay, so before we get started, a uh, little bit about myself. So I run a consultancy company called as uh, Hyphen OS Software Lab. So that's mostly into system software. Uh, Python is my main programming language. So mostly Django for backend based system and stuff like that. And I also do some fun programming in Python. In fact, uh, last time I had given a talk about uh, one such project that I had tried. Uh, here are some pointers to contact me. I'm not there on uh, Twitter. And uh, the slides will be available uh, after the talk. So, all right, get, get started. So what am I hoping out of this talk, actually? So I'm hoping that after listening to this talk, you should be able to write Python bindings for your favorite C library. OK, in an afternoon is probably an ambitious goal, but at least you don't feel intimidated by writing Python extensions. I think if that is something I can, if I'm able to achieve, that will be pretty good. And I'm hoping that you'll be interested a little bit about Wireshark and packet processing in general. Okay, uh, these are like networking things. Okay, so more concretely, what we'll be looking at is a bit of background about the problem statement, how this got started. Then we will be looking more at CFFI, uh, which is which stands for C Foreign Function Interface. Uh, we will start by looking at what are the choices for writing Python bindings. And then we will be looking at different stages of working with CFFI, what I call it as the development stage, deployment stage, and runtime stage. Then some more practical advice about CFFI, about some, what I say, some not so frequently asked questions. Um, finally, time permitting, we will have a quick demo of the stuff. Uh, questions I'm mostly be going to be taking offline. So after this, I'll be available on Zulip chat or one of the hallways, uh, let's say, whichever is the free, okay? All right, so uh, what happened, a friend of mine actually said that uh, he wanted to dump some packets from a network interface into Elasticsearch so that he could do uh, he could do certain anal analytics on them. So my natural first uh, reaction was, why don't you do something like this? There is a utility called T-Shark, which is, developed by the same guys who develop Wireshark, and it basically gives you a nice JSON output, and then just curl it through post to Elastic Web API. Or alternatively, uh, Elastic had got their own something called as a packet bit, which allows one to dump packets into Elastic. So it turns out that the first approach, there is a problem in the sense that it is really slow, and one can very clearly see that you are actually taking the output of a process, and then taking as an input, and there's a lot of things that is happening, and this was not quite well. The problem with Elastic Packet Beat was that even though it was being for the very same purpose, it did not have the required protocols that are required to be supported for that, uh, the protocol that he was interested in. So yes, that was not a choice. So what do we really need? So what we really need is we need uh, the dissectors in Wireshark. We'll see in a minute what a dissector is in the Python world. And why is that so? Because then we can use Python's Elastic uh, bindings or Python's Elastic API to dump into Elastic. And uh, then using dissectors in Python, we can dissect the packets from the network interface. So that's basically uh, the idea. I mean, that's the problem statement, right? So quickly, let's look at what a dissector is. So it's, a dissector is basically, if you look at it, a packet is just a stream of bits or bytes, however you want to see it. So what a dissector does, it's a function, it's a program turned in C, of, in the case of Wireshark, it's written in C. It takes that bit stream and converts it into a human or machine readable format. So here we are looking at JSON. So now what you can do is, you can then dump this JSON into, uh, let's say Elastic, or do whatever you want to do. So basically what we now want is this functionality, which is available with Wireshark as a C library in the Python world, okay? So now our prob original problem statement, like dumping packets into Elastic is now coming, has become developing Wireshark bindings for the, uh, uh, developing Python bindings for Wireshark. 
okay so now uh, what are the choices so of course there is c types uh, that uh, we have looked at and that comes with standard library then of course there is cffi which we are going to be looking at in little more detail there are a couple of other choices uh, cython is quite popular with pandas and uh, the numpy guys twig is one which is developed uh, by david bisley and it has got it's a little quirky in the sense or you could just do all the heavy lifting writing python api yourself but this is kind of non trivial for a fairly big libraries like wireshark okay so uh, what is cffi so cffi stands for c foreign functions interface so what it basically does is you take you have some functionality in the c world in this case wireshark and then you have you want to bring that functionality or you want to call that functionality from the python world okay and cffi helps you do that okay and one of the stated goals of cffi i'll just directly quote from the cffi's goal is to be able to call c code from python without learning a third language and this is very important uh, i mean if you have worked with swig uh, or python i have not looked at python in detail but swig has got a its interface files it's it's like learning something new again or you have to learn the apis like that you would do in cffi so cffi lives to this goal pretty well okay so yes so now our problem statement is now okay so we have now made a choice of using the cffi for python binding okay so uh, a disclaimer uh, so uh, we'll be seeing a lot of code from this library that i have developed which is called as wishp it's open source it will be available uh, i'm trying to keep this as much generic as possible but at some places it's just good to use the code that is already available okay so uh, okay let's get started looking at uh, cffi then okay so uh, what are the main features so cffi actually allows one to interface with c libraries in what is called as an application binary interface or an application programming interface so application binary interface is basically something like you do a dl open and then the functions in the c world can be directly called from the um, from the python module itself uh, CFFI developers themselves don't recommend this way uh, because this this is even though this is good enough to quickly try stuff this has got this is kind of limited in terms of what all you can do okay uh, it it doesn't allow you to do with uh, nice things certain thing and it's even actually it's slower so and then there is basically another one called as application programming interface so what does that really mean so it basically means is you start with something called a c definitions you'll see in a minute what they are okay for your python bindings and these c definitions will be some types and functions from your underlying c library and then what you do is cffi there are a set of apis that cffi provides you actually generate a c file and that will compile into a python model so that is like at a very high level that is what it is uh, it is doing okay so now we'll be looking in little more details about this api mode okay and what i call it as practical advice so whenever we are working with uh, any new library uh, so our first goal is to actually get that functionality in the python world uh, or wherever we want okay so here what i'm going to be talking about is basically three stages of development so first is the development stage where you are somehow figuring out how to get the c functionality in the c land into the python land once you have gotten to that the next is about build and packaging where you want to actually make your functionality in the python world available to the rest of the world uh, through setup tool integration and stuff like that and finally what i call it as a runtime stage uh, is essentially about how do you think in terms of your own api so that is uh, these are the three different stages is what we are going to be looking at next okay so development stage you start with a library whose api you want to bring in python world so we have already looked at that okay so you start with something called as cdef in the cffi speak or which is basically c definition okay so we'll see what c definitions are so before we go there let's look at what a c library is okay in in a c for a c library right the header files is actually the api of the c library okay and what do these header files contain they contain the structures constant type there some hash defined or they actually contain some function so if you really look at it a c library actually has got two types of api or two parts to the api so one is what i call it as types api 
and then another one is what we call it as a functions api or funks api okay uh, a good let's start let's look at a simple example let's say you are trying to uh, map this library called as spam into the python world and the the api which is in the spam/pu.h that looks something like this see here if you actually look at it right there are two parts here so there is a constant in bar which is actually a type in my uh, loosely speaking it's actually a const but we can you know, just hide it under a type and spam all is actually a function or a functionality that the library is provide right so now to get this into cffi world what we do, what we start with is we start by defining something called a c definition as follows okay so we define spam to types.h and func.h okay and then the next step is cffi provides another api called as uh, a class called as api uh, ffi and what here you do is you take this functionality you take this definition and you are basically now trying to include this definition into this ffi object that we have created okay so uh, there are a couple of advantages of why you would like to do that okay in uh, fairly big libraries like for example wireshark which where there are easily like about a dozen header files actually little more than that uh, separating this uh types and funs actually helps because in some places you are only interested in taking types uh, and you don't want the funs to be uh, leaking in that definition second thing is uh, readability of overall the source code of your cffi uh, c definition improves a lot by separating code like this okay and uh, it also allows us to reorganize the code pretty well so what i have actually seen uh, in some of the c bindings uh, people have uh, that people have written using cffi people have dumped created a huge uh, python multi uh, line string and dumped all the c definitions into that kind of makes uh, working with it a little difficult okay and once you have this c definition what is the next step that you are going to do you you are going to be uh, verifying uh, so the cffi provides two api called as verify and fetch so they pretty much do the same thing okay what is the same thing that they do is they use the cdef that you started with or the definitions that you started with and then generate a .c file uh, with some boilerplate code to help you compile okay so both of them are actually doing it so now you have the cdef or the c definition so now the next step is actually to say okay now i'm going to be verifying or uh, actually trying to build the c definitions on my machine so that i can develop python by me so one thing to remember this is going to be requiring all the uh, all your compiler tool chain for this and even the python dev packages so this is something you need to remember and of course the uh, dev version of the library that you are trying to be uh, that you are trying to compile uh, because you need access to the header and the source file okay now uh, a simple advice is uh, even though verify and set source actually provide a very similar functionality verify is kind of limited in terms of what it can do where a set source allows you to set path for your generated python module etc okay so set source is something that we want to use when we are going to be uh, when we are going to be distributing it using uh, set of tools okay uh, so generally a good idea is to separate this into a separate wrapper builder module okay and then you can use it in setup.py uh, in a minute we will be looking at an example uh, that is going to be telling what exactly we are going to be doing and we can just use verify to quickly verify our finding so these these are the two apis that we will look at it okay so here if you take a look at an example i started with an ffi object this is something we have already seen so we added one or more c definitions okay that is something c then i'm giving a package name so this is going to be my fully uh, uh, full package name and then there is i'm defining something called as a package config library so if you have used package config in the past or if you are aware it helps you to actually generate the uh, hash include uh, basically minus i and minus l uh, c flag okay and then i am basically saying that you set source package config with this okay so this is i have kind of primed the lip uh, pcap ffi module doing this setup okay now what i do is i have a, a some a in some kind of a pcap builder uh, module in the same path okay what i am doing here is when i run that module using python minus m blah 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 what i can do is i can actually just quickly verify that whatever i have package actually works and makes sense and then i will simply start with a uh, printing the generated pcap library and then i will i'm just 
trying out some functions from that particular library so once i got this part working that means i have gotten some functionality that was there in the c world into python world okay so uh, that is the basic idea okay and once this works we will be getting ready for the next thing okay a uh, couple of things to remember here is rather than trying to get everything uh, into python world first and working it's probably a good idea to try some very simple functionality like most of the libraries will have some some kind of a function that says print version so if you are uh, and if you are able to get that print version function in the library back into uh, back into the python world using the verify above you are pretty much all set because then what you really have to do is you have to keep adding more functions and more types to this okay uh, which is kind of the workflow is set i'm not saying it's very straightforward but the workflow is set okay so this is essentially what we have covered so far is okay how do we get some functionality from the c world into python world so that was essentially about the development phase okay so next is about the build and distribution set stage so here we will be looking more about uh, the setup tools in integration but even before that let's look at a couple of things okay so uh, when we were writing the source for the c definition okay so all the c definitions will go into the src directory okay uh, so this kind of fits very well with the mentioned model of using the c sources and libraries as well another advantage of this advantage of this is src is packaged as as this so if you do a python setup.py as this this is where you will be doing and the wrapper builder that we looked at it we will be including uh, including it in the setup.py so uh, so far we have looked at uh, at least three api or four three apis the ffi class the verify and set source so cffi also provides one more api called as cffi modules which is primarily for setup uh, tools integration so the wrapper builder module that we looked at in the first one we will be actually using uh, that for the setup tools integration okay the code looks something like this so here i have actually two ffi modules so that's why i'm doing uh, i'm doing uh, two uh, ffi modules so if you really look at it it's it's the same thing so i have taken this from uh, from basically a module called epan builder.py and then there is the lippy cap ffi that we looked at is actually uh, the ffi object and once you pass it like this to to cffi through cffi uh, modules cffi takes care of building and making sure it works okay so this kind of makes things really easy uh, if you want to work with otherwise a uh, setup tool integration you don't have to do any heavy lifting this is just like adding three lines to your setup.py to get it working okay uh, so that uh, with that uh, we are basically coming to an end of what 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 does it take to actually build and distribute okay then comes the next part which is the runtime stage so here we will be speaking a little bit about how the users of your bindings are going to be using okay often i the user for your binding is just you perhaps only you okay which is the case with wishpy right now uh, for a practical use case uh, so what do we do okay so one of the things to do to go about is we should be providing our own api that wraps the library under this okay we should not be simply just okay take all the apis from the underlying library and make them available to people in the python world okay that's probably not a good idea okay of course we should make that available uh, make that available just in case somebody is interested in but we should also be thinking about what kind of apis that we are going to be providing because that is very important because the users of our library will be more used to programming in python than let's say programming in c so our apis should be more such that they think more in python and not think in terms of wrapped library uh especially uh, for libraries for for a few c libraries definitely true for uh, lib wireshark uh their apis are not not very nice okay you have to do a lot of uh, tweaking around uh, in order to uh, call their api and that's kind of a lot of details that the users of your library it's better if basically they are uh, they are hidden hidden from the users of your library okay so for the users of your library the wrap library is just a detail that they need not worry about okay they are they just care about the apis that uh, you are making available okay uh, for example in the case of wishp what we have is if, if 
essentially wrapping two libraries. There is a library called as a libpcap, and there is another library called as Wireshark. So these are the libraries written in C, and this wrapping these libraries in Python. So we, of course, we make these APIs available as it is to user if they are interested in. Uh, but we define a couple of our own APIs called as a capturer and dissector. So what does a capturer do? A capturer is just a class that is mean for capturing live packets from network devices or from an offline decap file. A dissector is a class that basically for dissecting the packets and generating a JSON from that. Okay. And for the users of your library, or in this case, this library, they only really need to care about the capturer and a dissector. They don't need to worry about over oh, do I, I mean, they don't even need to know whether there is a lib wire shark underneath it. Okay. And this has got another advantage uh, when we work like this. So if you remember when we were uh, packaging it, we were separating the SRC and the lib part. So when we are, when we want to work with multiple libraries, okay, and this is particularly true with, uh, with the case of Wireshark because certain uh, distributions have certain version of Wireshark library that is 2.6 and certain distribution will have a newer version, let's say 3.2. Now you ideally your binding should support both of them. Of course, when you support, when you say it will support both of them does not mean they will be supported at a given instance of time. Uh, only one will be supported, but on different machines, multiple can be supported. So separating the code into SRC and lib actually allows us to do that as well. So when we said SRC, so all our library specific stuff, uh, especially a version specific stuff goes under SRC. And when we build the module, our path will take care of building the lib part. Okay. So this, yeah. so in summary, what do we have is define something called as API.py or you might even use a more descriptive name. For example, in which we call it as capturer and dissector.py, but that doesn't matter. Then you have uh, something called as a wrapper.py module. Uh, just make it, just let users know this is kind of an internal detail. Don't worry about it by making it underscore wrapper. Okay. And all the wrapping specific things go inside wrapper.py. And one advantage of this is basically tomorrow I come up with even a better library than live by shot. I don't know how. But let's say I come up with, I'm just going to be saying, okay, you know what? I'm going to be replacing this wrap library with another library. And my APIs don't change the users of my library are generally happy. Okay. Uh, so this is essentially what we should think about when we think about APIs in, they should be more Pythonic and they should hide all the details inside uh, a wrapper or Okay. Uh, so with that, we what we have covered is we got and started, then we built and packaged. We thought a little bit about uh, the APIs, uh, how they should be there. Uh, in the next part, uh, what we are going to be looking at is we will be looking at not what I call it as not so commonly, uh, not so frequently asked questions. Okay. Uh, so few things. Uh, so basically, whenever we are talking with C code, there are few things that need to keep in mind. Okay. So garbage collection is one thing we need to keep in mind. Uh, and when, when, when I say that we need to make sure our objects remain in scope. So we'll see with an example. What do I really mean by that? See if my documentation is quite good about it, but good, important to know. So for example, let's take an example. We have something called as a my function and it is actually CFFI provides an API called as FFI.new. So this is more like a C malloc. Okay. And let's say our example is like, uh, our uh, function is like this. And what happens in this case is when you call, uh, when my function is in scope, val is there. Okay. But as soon as my function goes out of scope, val is, val can be potentially, uh, destroyed because it's no longer being referenced anywhere. Okay. So one of the ways of dealing with such situations is if you are using some class or an object, which you will typically have. So make this val, uh, part of that particular object. So as long as that particular object lives, your val is going to be alive. Uh, this is uh, one thing. So CFFI uh, documentation has got fewer, few examples of this. Uh, this is especially true when your Python code actually gets called uh, as a as a callback. Okay, because there the contexts are completely different. So you allocate in one context and use it in another context. So you want to make sure whatever you have allocated in the context is actually available when you are using in that context. Okay, so this is one. Uh, generally, uh, whenever you are working, you will be requiring some, some way of moving data between C and Python types and FFI.memmove is available. So this is like memcopy. 
i had to actually look at sources to figure this out so that's why i have actually included uh it's not quite easily available uh, all minutes. the fee calls okay all the fee calls that we are made are done by using uh, releasing gil so don't play around with python.h api so this looks something like this pi begin so all the fee calls get wrapped into between pi begin allow thread and pi end allow thread uh so you might want to read a little bit more about what do these macros do these are macros by the way and we looked yesterday that a lot of this is going to change but cffi will transparently do it for us so we don't have to worry about it something you need to know and then it's also possible to use python functions as callbacks uh in cffi documentation uh cffi has got a pretty do- a pretty good documentation about it okay uh a little bit about calls in fast path this is standard python uh performance improvement trip uh, trick you don't directly call uh, uh dereference you first make it first dereference it uh, into at a class or an object level and then use it because that saves you some time so this is basically some standard python uh i would say optimization trick but of course before doing any such optimizations it's probably always a good idea to profile your code first before doing and before doing that optimization but these kind of optimizations can sometimes give you 5 10% performance improvement and you will essentially be using cffi for something like or uh, something like things in the fast path okay uh, so uh, a, a little word about performance and this is specific to this particular problem uh, this problem is particularly a sweet spot for pypy because it's just just in time compiler and i have seen actually performances five times faster than c python so yes what we saw in the talk yesterday actually holds true in fact in a couple of runs this actually does better than uh, t sharp written in c that's not really a fair comparison but what i'm trying to say is we are coming at a at an acceptable i would say acceptable overhead compared to t sharp written in c so getting into python world actually has got a merit okay uh, so let's quickly look at the demo uh for this so will uh, so you remember our original problem statement like getting the packets from an interface into elastic so this is one example where i have gotten a packet from a pcap file uh into an elastic and this is basically uh i'm just transferring this so i'm just i have just done it already and uh this is uh, some visualization using that and if you look at it and if you guys uh, if some of you know about tcp congestion control looking at it you can quickly say oh this looks like uh, evaluation of tcp congestion window uh, evolution of tcp congestion window not evaluation mm-hmm. uh, okay yeah i'm about to be done so this is uh, basically this is through which p what we have gotten uh, into this and then finally let's look at the demo uh, so i have here uh, two virtual environments so this is a virtual environment and what i'm here doing here is uh, i am actually running t shark which is a utility by the way which uses the wish p for 20000 packets using uh, this is standard c python okay it takes something like 12 uh, seconds or whatever and then we actually can have pi pi based thing and this takes about 2 3 seconds so you you can already see this is like really 4 4 and a half times fast okay and then i am doing here is basically i am running the same thing on t shark uh, using uh, the t shark utility that is available with wire shark sources so i have this is a quick uh, shell script so this is the time stamp and if you can quickly look at it this is going to take about 5 7 seconds okay so this particular run is actually faster than the uh, so our pi pi based stuff is actually faster than this this is not a fair comparison because if you look at it there is this generating output in dev nulling it uh, but that's another case why you need such functionality in python world because otherwise you will have to clearly rely on an anything that this pro, uh, that uh, that is provided only by uh, uh t-shirt utility okay Uh, with that i'm pretty much coming to the conclusion of my talk here are some code uh, feel free to check out uh, there's pretty decent documentation of course it can still be better and i have also got some example code where a couple of example one for elastic another for redis and i'm also speak soon be adding for kafka but, uh, yeah and with that i'm kind of coming to the end of my talk and if 
say one of them maybe mars let's say i'll be available in mars all day after the talk okay 